Hi everyone, welcome back to the Nico the Vet channel. Uh, I thought today what we do, what we might do is tackle the, the subject of, of pain, this long-term pain management. And typically this, this, this applies to dogs with arthritis. So, so long-term arthritic pain, um, or joint pain specifically. Um, people often say to me with an older dog, oh, you know, he's, he's not lame, he, he's, he's not in any pain at all, he's absolutely fine. And I say, but look at him, he's, he's limping. And they go, well, yes, he is limping, but he's not in pain. Well, limping is a symptom of pain. So if you're limping, you're in pain. Or they say, well, he's not really limping, um, or he's not really lame either, uh, but when he gets up in the mornings, he seems you know, really, really stiff and he, and he uh, sleeps more and he doesn't really play with his ball anymore. So to me, all of those are red flags. All of those are, this dog is, probably is in fact in pain and I would want to examine them and try to understand why. Uh, so again, today we're going to focus on, on dogs particularly and on uh, arthritic pain. So first of all, if we start off with arthritis, what does the term arthritis mean? All medical terms that sound so, so, so very clever actually break down very simply. So anything ending in itis means inflammation. So if you have appendicitis, it's itis is inflammation, and the first part of the word tells you uh, infl inflammation of what? Appendicitis, inflammation of the appendix. Or you could have uh, conjunctivitis, uh, the conjunctiva is the membrane lining the inside of your eyelids and the surface of your eyeball. Uh, so if you say you've got conjunctivitis, you've got itis, which is inflammation, and of the what? Of the conjunctiva. So arthritis is just the same. Arthro means joint, itis means inflamed. So just a little bit of a, <laughs> of, a of a rant, I suppose. Uh, I'm frustrated when people say, oh, you know, is, I, I, I or my dog have got arthritis because all that means is your joint is inflamed and it could be inflamed for many reasons. You could have an infection or you could have a, a sprain or a strain or you could have wear and tear uh, or you could have an injury of some description uh, or, or a, ver um, a myriad of other issues. So so just to be pedantic, when I say arthritis and I, and I say this, I make the mistake as much as anyone, what I actually mean is sort of a wear and tear arthritis. So when you have a joint that's meant to fit together nice and well like, a, like, a, like the hip, the ball uh, going in the socket, when it moves around it's designed to move around but when it starts grating and grinding and damaging the cup and the ball that's what we mean by uh, arthritis so enough enough of the pedantics so um, for the next the next question is uh, okay so my dog's got arthritis in younger dogs particularly in all dogs but in younger dogs particularly dogs just don't suddenly one morning wake up and have arthritis and again I'm going to use that term to mean sort of a w abnormally uh, fast and destructive wear and tear process on the joint so dogs just don't suddenly wake up and have arthritis so if you have arthritis uh, uh, and, and the lameness or the limping or the difficulty getting up that goes with it uh, immediately uh, you need to try and identify why why have you got this abnormal wear and tear causing pain and inflammation uh, in the joint uh, the arthritis process because if you can identify the reason why you can you can, and you can fix that reason well then you've just killed uh, multiple birds with one stone a you've gotten rid of the pain b you've improved the dog's quality of life and c hopefully you have uh, um, slowed down or stopped the ongoing wear and tear process so you don't have this ongoing damage and destruction to the knee uh, i say knee to, to the joint uh, um, so what do I mean by that? So if, you, if we consider the, the joints one by one, so if you've got hip pain, the most likely reason for hip pain is you have hip dysplasia. Uh, and dysplasia just means, dys means wrong, plasia means to grow. It just means it hasn't grown properly. Uh, and one version of that would be, again, if you've got a ball going into a socket and you've got a ball and socket joint, if the socket is very shallow, the ball isn't contained in it and it starts moving around, bouncing around, and it's bashing, 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 bashing as it moves around, and that's hip dysplasia so if you've got a if you've got hip arthritis in inverted commas again uh, uh, why it's most likely due to hip dysplasia and uh, yes you can either manage the the pain and inflammation or you can correct the dysplasia uh, that's where the hip stops stops being a good joint uh, a good example because the only way to fix that uh, rather uh, is to do a hip replacement once you've done the hip replacement you've no longer got this bit of bone bashing on the bashing on the on the other bit of bone so you've now got a nice tight fitting thing and your pain is gone and you don't need pain painkillers if you if you've got pain in the in the knee uh, far and away the most common cause for pain in the knee is a cruciate ligament problem so again 
just treating the pain and the inflammation and the ensuing arthritis is not ideal. Ideally, you want to fix the cruciate problem, and if you fix that, then your, uh, your dependency or your requirement for the pain management is much less to non-existent, um, and so on and so on. So lots of examples in, in the various joints. So if you have a dog who has a joint issue, rather than just medicating them, first see if we can fix the problem. Yes, uh, almost always that fix uh, means uh, doing some sort of surgery, but th then you literally are fixed I mean, in most cases, and you don't you don't have the ongoing destructive process, you don't have the ongoing wear and tear, and you don't have the ongoing pain. So we want to fix these guys if we can with the surgery, because not only does it help them today, but it also means when they're elderly and they're old men and women, um, they don't have the, the, the major arthritis that they would have otherwise. But let's, for today's talk, focus on um, cases where, for whatever reason, surgery uh, or the fix in inverted commas is not an option. So we're down to managing the pain and the inflammation, uh, which is manifesting as the, the lameness or the difficulty getting up uh, uh, from rest. Um, and... Um, what are the options there? So the options are uh, uh, for, for the management of these guys, the medical management, um, um, are you give them medication. So we give them medicines of some description. Uh, we control their weight and we control their exercise. So just to get the, the last two out of the way, uh, to state the obvious, if you've got a great big fat dog or, or you yourself or have got a gammy knee, for example, and you're overweight, yes, you're just carrying more weight on that gammy joint. And the simple act of just losing weight puts less forces, less um, strain through your joints and you'll immediately feel better. So if you've got a, if your dog's a bit chubby, a bit portly, um, definitely let's get them to lose weight down to their, uh, uh, their, their um, uh, ideal weight, uh, and then they won't be carrying this extra burden on the, on the joints, and they may not even need the, the management there. They may actually then start to cope quite well. The simplest way to think about it is put a heavy rucksack on, fill it with bricks, walk around with it, and your joints will also, you'll feel it, you'll feel it in your knees and your hips, and when you take the rucksack off, uh, you feel much, much better. So that rucksack analogy is get rid of the fat put it down, get rid of the fat. Also, if you have now, let's say you have the wear and tear in the joint, you have the arthritis, and when I say wear and tear, with this bumping and grinding of the, of, of the, of the two bones that make the joint, with the bumping and grinding together, the body does a silly thing. It makes extra new sort of sticky, outy, fluffy, lumpy bits of bone. So, so let's say the, the, the hip going into the, the, the socket again, and the socket, where it's being bashed by the, by the hip moving around, will start to make sort of sticky, outy, fluffy bits of bone dotted around all over. Imagine someone's just taken bits of clay and sort of stuck them all over the place. And the same with the, with the, with the, the ball part. Imagine sort of fluffy bits of clay, which are new bones sticking up. Now this joint is even more ill-fitting and there's even more grating and grinding, which damages the, the joint cartilage. And there's an important point. The ends of the bones, think of it as just sort of bone going down to the end of the bone and then covering the bone is the joint cartilage. And that joint cartilage has a lot of functions. It's very, very smooth, so it helps it to glide against the, the joint cartilage of the opposing bone. Um, uh, but also it covers uh, all the nerve endings. You've got, a, you've got an awful lot of nerve endings in the bone underneath the cartilage. So once you've worn that cartilage away, you've got all those bone, in, bone uh, nerve endings jangling away, and that's, that's gonna be a permanent thing for you because once you've eroded your joint cartilage, that is it, we cannot fix you. Uh, with, with all the best will in the world, I mean, that is the holy grail of management. If we could somehow get you to grow new cartilage, then no one would need a hip replacement because um, um, you would just keep regrowing the cartilage which protects the two joints. But so far, we've not been successful doing that. So, um, so going back to the three cornerstones of managing someone with arthritis, uh, lose weight first if you're overweight. Secondly, moderate your exercise because if you've got all these new fluffy, sticky, outy bits of bone affecting the joint and you now have an ill-fitting joint, then you really have to moderate what you do in terms of exertion. So in a human being, for example, with arthritis, you can still go walking, you can still go uh, maybe a light jog, you can still go swimming, you can go to work, you can go shopping, you can be active, but probably you don't want to go play uh, a jolting, jarring activity like play rugby or play squash, for example. So the same thing applies to our dogs. So if they have this degenerative change in the joint and there's bits grating and grinding on each other, then if they love, you know, frantically chasing the ball with all the sort of the, the, the very sort of violent stop, start, twist, turn, jump, that's not going to do their joints any favor. So you may have to give up the ball games or moderate them. So with my own dog, she loves it so much, I, I, can't, I can't bring myself to stop the ball games, but I just moderate. I now do it from one to two meters apart and I sort of roll a turn and, 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 or, or throw it as easily so that she can catch it rather than chasing it. And that way she's still playing the ball game, but she's not 
just jarring these 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 ill-fitting joints. So drop the weight and uh, adjust the exercise. And then medication. So we want to actually give you something to help to help you with this. So how do the medications um, work? Think of pain as a process. So. For example, if, if, I had a sore, if I had a sore joint in my finger, so I had arthritis in this finger joint here, how can I try to control the pain that I'm experiencing? So point one, step one, I can try to give, take some medication which acts directly on the joint. So it actually, where the pain signal, if you like, is coming from, try and block that pain signal there. The second point is, if I, if, 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 if I can't block the pain signal there, remember that pain signal travels along the nerves, up my arm, to my spinal cord, up my spinal cord, to my brain that goes, hello, my finger's sore. So I can focus on treating the pain where it is. I can somehow try to stop the pain message getting to my brain, uh, or I can try to make my brain ignore the pain message when it arrives. So it's either treat the pain where it is, treat the conduction of the information to the brain, or treat the brain and make the brain ignore the pain. Now at that point, a lot of people say to me, well, oh, I don't really want to give my dog with arthritis. I don't want to give them medications because it's not actually fixing anything. It's just, it's just treating the symptom. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> exactly, that's the point. If we can't uh, give them a new perfect joint, then of course we need to treat the pain and the inflammation. Uh, and of course that doesn't fix the problem, but it gives you back a, a quality of life. So. So I don't, I've never really understood that argument that I don't just want to, I just want to give him uh, chemicals and I don't want to give him medications. It's no good for him. Well, the answer is, yes, yeah, short of doing a, a joint replacement, uh, he needs or he needs that medication. Uh, and, and yes, it doesn't fix the problem, but it alleviates the pain associated with the problem. So, so I can't see why you would deny your dog uh, the pain, the pain relief in the absence of replacing the, the joint. So if we look at the medications we have again, so if we're treating the pain where it happens, so in my finger or in the, like in the dog, it could be in the wrist, it could be elbow, it could be shoulder, it could be knee, ankle, wherever you like. Um, try and treat the pain where it happens. So, so for, 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 for that category of, of medication, uh, we would sort of split that into three categories. You have what are called the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that's abbreviated to NSAIDs. Then you get the steroid-based anti-inflammatory drugs. And then you get the third category, which are neither steroid nor non-steroidal, and they work on a slightly different pathway. And, and that's where we would have things like um, uh, paracetamol and cartrophin. But let's go back to the beginning of the list. So if you have pain and, and inflammation in the joint, we want to block that pain there. So first category of drugs are the, non, are the NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory plugs. Uh, drugs. Not a plug now, but trade names that we'd all be familiar with, would be things like Metacam or their competitor products containing Meloxicam, and then drugs like uh, Rimadyl, Previcox, uh, Onzior uh, are probably the most commonly known ones. These are, all do what exactly what it says on the tin. They are non-steroidal, so they are not steroids. They are anti-inflammatory drugs. So they treat the pain and the inflammation at the site. Uh, I find they're very, very safe drugs. People are very anxious uh, about, you know, could they damage the liver and the kidneys? Um, hypothetically, anything could damage the liver and the kidneys. If you think of the liver and the kidneys as to completely oversimplified as just filters, they fill everything you put in your body, so that's anything from your cheeseburgers to your medication, has to be filtered out to the body. The body takes what it wants and then the, the, the residue is filtered out and gotten rid of. And this happens through your liver and your kidneys. So in theory, um, um, you concentrate whatever it is you put into your body, you're concentrating it in your liver and your kidneys and holding it there for a while before you eject it from your body. So in theory, while it's all being concentrated and just sitting there, uh, it, uh, in theory, anything could do harm. So with steroids, we, we, we do wonder about this potential to do harm, but in because uh, pharmacologically, you would predict that that might happen. But in real terms, it's exceedingly rare. You've probably got more chance of... Uh, of, of um, uh, um, having a car crash on your way home from work today than you have of causing a liver or kidney problem in your in your dog when you give them medications. And in fact, some studies have shown anti-inflammatories not only do they not harm the kidneys given in appropriate doses, uh, they may even benefit uh, old age renal failure. But that's a, a talk for uh, another day. Uh, a good example of, of you know the safety of non steroidal anti-inflammatories is my own border collie years ago. She was born with just terrible hip and knee and elbow problems. Uh, 
So clearly not a candidate to have every single joint replaced. So we managed her on medications. And this medication started about a year old and she lived to about 13. And she was absolutely marvelous. Uh, she had terrific uh, endurance, terrific ability. Yes, she couldn't keep up with the, with the other border collie, had no issues at all, but she had a very full, very active life, jumping ditches, climbing over things, over, under, through, uh, great life. So wonderful drug, no problems. The more common side effects one might see with the non-steroidals are they can upset your tummy. They can cause inflammation and tummy upset, which you would see as vomiting, or um, usually as vomiting and a loss of appetite, and sometimes also diarrhea. Now that can happen, uh, and that can happen in us too, in any individual. Um, and uh, if that is the case with your own dog, then we just know, all right, that medicine doesn't suit you. Let's consider the either a different non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, perhaps it was just that one that didn't agree with you, or a different category of drug, of drug altogether. But just because, you know, my Auntie Mabel's friend's cousin's brother's dog had a reaction to a particular medication, it doesn't mean I should object to it in my own. It's a bit like the, uh, my Auntie Mabel's friend's Sarah uh, is intolerant to penicillin and she had a reaction to penicillin and almost died. Does that mean I shouldn't take penicillin? No, uh, we're all individuals. And so as a general rule, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are are terrific. Uh, try them out and see what you get. Uh, usually you'll know within uh, one to four weeks whether that medication is going to work with you for you or not and whether it, you're intolerant to it in any way. Again, if you're intolerant, not a train smash, just that one's not for you. They're very rare. Um, I've probably seen in 30 years less than 20 cases where I've gone, okay, that, that doesn't suit you. Let's try something else. So, so, so going back to options, so you can try the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Those would definitely be my favorite and you can take them once a day forever. Um, the other alternative are the steroid-based anti-inflammatories, something we used to use many, many years ago, but we really don't like to use them much anymore because, as everyone knows, long-term steroids uh, can have undesirable side effects. They're not catastrophic. So for, what are the side effects in, in cats and dogs? Uh, basically, you get, you get hungry, you get thirsty, you drink a lot, you pee a lot, you, you wee a lot, um, uh, you eat a lot, uh, and you'll start to get a pot belly, so a little fat, a little fat tummy. You start to lose a little bit of muscle on your, on your body and your legs. Your skin can thin, so you go a bit baldy, and you can be prone to infection. So uh, uh, those symptoms can happen. They do take quite some time to happen. Uh, and if they do happen and we don't like them, then we can withdraw the drug and all of that will reverse itself. So it's not like irreparable harm is done. But as a general rule, steroids are really not going to be the thing we reach for first. Uh, so then the next category, so we've dealt with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and then steroidal anti-inflammatories. The next category uh, are sort of the rest, if you like, uh, and the two big ones there would be um, Cartrophen, which contains pentasan polysulfate, which is a series of injections your dog has just under the scruff, so not into the joint. We just pick up the skin under the scruff and give it to them there. Um, for me, the jury is out on that one. Um, uh, it's, it's one of the drugs that I'm, I'm disappointed with more than I'm pleased with. So pentasan polysulfate, not a particular brand name. Um, and I just, when you look into it, it's just wishy-washy how it works. You know, it says things like it improves the production of cartilage. Remember we said the cartilage, if it's damaged, is, 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 uh, um, if, you could, if you could magic the cartilage back, a lot of your problems would go away. So it, it claims that pentasan polysulfate claims, claims to you know, imp improve cartilage production, uh, improve joint fluid pr production, which joint fluid is a good thing because it lubricates the joint so you have less of that grating and grinding uh, and it sort of in and it limits the amount of um, um, destruction of the um, joint cartilage that's going on so it helps it to come back and limits the destruction and it also has some sort of anti-inflammatory effect I just I'm not I'm just not convinced by it there's no disputing it does work uh, to some extent for some individuals, but it's not predictable like the non-steroidals, which are pretty much going to work for 99% of individuals 99% of the time, with the complication rate being extremely low. The pentasan polysulfate, for me, this course of injections, not a fan. Uh, it fails more often than it succeeds, uh, and um, I just look at how they tr explain that it works, and it just seems a little bit wishy-washy to me, so I'm just not convinced. Um, different parts of the world, vets are more or less enthusiastic about that. Um, I'm just... Um I'll just show my hand and say I'm not entirely I'm not entirely convinced. Um, and then in the same category there would be uh, which is like non not non steroidal not steroid. You also have paracetamol, not a mainstay drug for us. Um, something we might reach for if nothing else is is working. Uh, then we might reach for paracetamol. Uh, it is available as a veterinary formulation, um, but it's just not um, the mainstay. One of the one of the, the main front runners. The reason the front runners are the front runners. These are the non steroidals. Is that they they work. They work well. They 
cause no problems in, in the majority of individuals and um, um, why you know what, there's no need to start reaching for something else. So those are all the medications that treat the pain where it's happening. So if you can, if you can treat the pain where it's happening in your joint, that's you done. You're happy, you're moving around, you're running around, you're back to, you're back to your normal life, great. Carry on with that um, long term, that'll do you. If that's not enough, if that's not enough and you're still limping and you're still in pain, then we carry on with the, with the drugs, the anti-inflammatories that work where the pain is. So we carry on with them, don't stop those, we carry on with those. And then we try and block that nerve message going along the nerves up the spinal cord. So we try and block that, tr that, that conduction of that pathway and the drug we would use there would be called gabapentin. It's not a veterinary drug. It doesn't have a license for veterinary use, but we've used it a lot with animals uh, and, um, and uh, uh, I've not seen any significant problems with it. The only problem really we have is it can be quite sedating to begin with. So you get on it, you can see them just a bit woozy and wobbly. Most dogs will just get through that and their body gets used to it and then the wooziness goes away. I've had one whippet who was just looked like Jimi Hendrix on it, so that was no good at all. We had to, we had to, uh, <laughs> it's probably defamatory isn't it? it looked like uh, like a 70s musician if you, I should say uh, and she seemed quite stoned on it so uh, and then she didn't settle and you can't have a stone dog so that was no good for her that doesn't mean it's no good for anyone else it just means no good for her and we and we withdrew it but it makes sense so so now we're trying to block the brain the, the pain message getting to the brain if we could do that grand so let's say you're doing if you're using the anti-inflammatory that's not enough and I'm trying to block the pain message that's not enough what's the next step try and make the brain ignore the pain signal coming in. So what would you use to do that? You would use two drugs. Um, you would use uh, amantadine. Again, that's not a veterinary licensed drug. It's a human drug. Um, we're a little bit wishy-washy about exactly how it works, but to oversimplify it, let's just say it makes the brain ignore the pain signal coming in. Now back to the people who say, well, I don't want to just, you know, uh, I don't want to just cover over the symptoms and not address the problem. Well, the only way to address the problem is surgery. And if we're not going to do the surgery, let's cover over the problems. So we have a, uh, a, a pain-free dog. So yes, I am just treating the symptom. I'm not treating the cause of the problem, but I can't. So it's so a perfectly sensible way to go. The other thing to try and act uh, on to block pain, uh, on the brain at least, is to block the, is to make the brain ignore the pain impulse coming in, would be the opiates. So the morphine family of drugs. Um, they are they're okay if you use like morphine or pethidine they're really good for short-term pain so so uh, you just had a major surgery for example or a major injury lovely um think of them as what they call narcotic dissociative analgesics narcotic think of it again as your 70s rocker stoned um dissociative means um your brain just dissociates itself from from the pain analgesic means uh pain uh, relieving so basically it works on two mechanisms one it makes you a um, little bit stoned and the way people have explained it to me when they've had opiates uh, and they've got pain uh, one chap explained to me he said well I can still feel the pain I just don't seem to care about it so I'm still aware it's there but it's not troublesome so that was an interesting way of putting it it's always stuck with me um, but and it does also to a degree try to block the, 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 the nerve uh, impulse conduction so basically we're hitting the pain three ways then treat the pain where the problem is if that's not enough stop the nerve conduction uh, so you add that to it if that's not enough start acting on the brain the problem with the opiates going back to them for long-term use in dogs the most common kind of long-term tablety form we would use in in, in people that some people might be familiar with is tramadol so uh, the problem with tramadol is when you take your tramadol tablet the the form of the drug in the tablet isn't the active form it has to go through your liver and effectively be activated and switched on into its active form now our livers do that really well so if you take your tablet you know almost all of it then gets switched on and activated into the active form and it's and it has its positive benefits so in human beings it's a good choice drug in cats it, uh, their livers do that very well too their livers switch it on and you get a good response uh, um, but in dogs their, their liver act activation of the tramadol is is very poor meaning uh, in human like I say in human beings you take you take the tablet 100 almost 100 percent of it gets converted to the active form in dogs they take they take the medication and very little of it so so very very little of it I don't know what a number would be but but so little of it that it's almost not ben beneficial gets activated into the active form which will then help you so so 
when we give something like tramadol, I'm just not, I'm just not, a, I'm just not a fan over the years. Uh, I've seen it fail more than it helps. I'm just not convinced. Um, so it is something I would try, perhaps if all else had failed. But it's not one of the drugs I, I would reach for first. So, so as you can see. Managing, if you've got the hobbly arthritic dog, managing these guys is multifactorial. We've got a whole bunch of medications to look at and we treat the pain at various points. Pain, pain source, pain conduction, pain interpretation. And we also get you to lose weight so there's less grating and grinding. And we also moderate, moderate your exercise um, so it's appropriate to how much your, your joints can handle. And the last point to make is, okay, if we, well the second last, if we are using the medications uh, how should we use them? Should we just use them when you when you're painful, uh, or should we use them all the time? And now, if you're just painful, you know, uh, and again, and for whatever reason, we've decided we're in, uh, either not going to investigate the source of the problem, or we have, and we've decided we're not actually going to fix it. What I mean by that is surgery, and and or any reason is perfectly legitimate. You just you don't want to do it. You don't, you, you don't have the money. Uh, you don't have the resource. Whatever. If you just decide you're not going to do it, then we have to obviously treat the pain. So. And also understand that if we don't address the problem, the problem is just going to get worse over time and the requirement for medical management is going to get more and more and more and more. Um, so, but if we've decided um, we're not going to do that, then then if you're only getting one or two limping episodes uh, every so, so often, that's fine. Treat it when you see it um, uh, and uh, you don't have to go all the time. So that's called sort of tactical treatment. But if you have someone who's pretty much hobbling all the time or straining to get up all the time or, or limping to get up all the time, um, then, then, and they benefit from the medications, then really you want to put them on it all day, uh, so a dose every day for the rest of their lives. And uh, some people have anxiety about the problems that may be caused there. Like say in reality, although you would, you would suggest these might happen, it's, they almost never happen. Uh, when, when, we've using, when we're using the appropriate drugs for that um, individual. Uh, and there's a long explanation for that called central sensitization. There's a lot of studies they've done in human beings too. But yes, you want to treat all the time rather than tactically if you if you lay more than, say, two or three times um, a year. And I will often see an older dog who's perhaps just come in for his vaccinations, and I'll just get a sense that, the, you know, the old boy or the old girl is just, just not mobile, they're just a little bit sort of creaky. Uh, and I'll often say to people, oh, is, you know, is he or she lame? And they say, no. And I say, is he reluctant to get up? No. And sometimes I just look at you and go, blimey, you know, you're a 12-year-old Labrador. You, you have to have arthritic pain, even though I can't necessarily demonstrate it. And a lot of these guys, I will do just a, a a, a, a drug trial. So I'll put you on one of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for two weeks and we see what happens. And either way, it's a win. So for example, if suddenly uh, um, this dog that we all thought was okay, just sort of just getting old and slowing down, and if your dog is slowing down, almost certainly they've got slowing down in inverted commas, they've got arthritis. Um, so um, what I do is give them this little experiment and I say, well, take some medications for a week and I say to uh, the owner of the dog, let me know. Um, and Inevitably, they're going to phone me back and go, oh, blummy, I, you know, I, I thought he was just old and slowing down, but suddenly he's playing with his ball again, he's quite chipper, he's quite socially interactive, he wants to play with the family, he's almost like a puppy again. One lady gave me a good example that um, she said she had one of those barn door type kitchen doors where the top opens, you keep the bottom locked, and she said that she hadn't really realised it, but as a youngster, her dog would always put her paws on top of the door and sort of peer over and see what was going on in the outside world, and she said she hadn't really noticed the dog had stopped doing that but once we did the, the medical trial this was a golden retriever she said suddenly you know she came in the kitchen and there the dog was fetal thing peering outside again so 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 yes when you improve their 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 pain and inflammation it's not just in terms of the lameness that we're trying to improve them we're trying to improve just their reach their flexibility and that whole ease and comfort of movement because not only does it improve their their walking around it improves all the other peripheral stuff that goes with it like looking over the door going up and down the stairs getting in and out of your um your car um and sleep particularly if you think about yourself when you've got a sore anything a sore back a sore shoulder a sore knee it really disturbs your sleep uh, and if you're sleep deprived all the time it does affect your mood uh, and your uh, sociability so by improving their pain not again not only do we have them moving more comfortably we've got them on walks we've also got, got them uh, just generally moving more comfortably and the quality of sleep is massively improved so everything about it just makes your quality of life better and people inevitably come to me and say oh my word you know this is terrific and these are dogs that I often can't identify a specific problem I just think you're just a creaky there's a lot of you know wear and tear on you in the same way that when your car's done a hundred thousand miles you've got a lot of wear and tear the last subject to hit are the nutraceuticals. 
So it's stuff we can sort of, not medicine, if you like, in the true sense of the word, stuff we can sort of put in your food and add additives, perhaps. Um, the most common ones there are glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, um, cod liver oil, uh, green nut muscle, um, turmeric, perhaps, uh, and, and, and the rest, really. There's a whole bunch of them. These are very frustrating. Um, the only sensible study that's ever been done on these is basically, do they work or not, was done, done in human beings um, some years ago, where they ignored the placebo effect. So they didn't ask the people whether they felt they were better. It was what's called a double-blinded uh, trial. So the doctors were giving the people medications and they didn't know what they were giving them because that was concealed from the doctors. The people didn't know what they were receiving and the researchers were then monitoring them and ignoring whether they felt they were better because Betty might feel she's better because she's having pink tablets and Fred might think he's not better because he's having blue tablets. So, so they took all the subjectivity out of it and just relied on um, blood tests uh, to measure inflammatory markers in the body. But basically what came out of that study was that none of these products that we were hoping would work do actually or can be demonstrated to work. Uh, so the gluco glucosamine, chondroitin sulfate, cod liver oil, turmeric, uh, uh, none, of, none of these could be proven to actually give a benefit to the individual taking it, except for one thing, green-lipped muscle, which is exactly what it says. It's muscles like moule de marinée, is my attempt at French. Uh, the muscles that people eat, I think, I think it's, I think they're pretty gross, but people, people like them, and they particularly ones with green lips. Uh, I think farmed traditionally off New Zealand. So they found these did benefit the people and it prompted a bit of research into it and they found that yes, um, there is actually a natural anti-inflammatory which would fit into the group of drugs that I favor, uh, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Well, your green lip muscles contain a bit of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, and, and so that's why it benefits these people uh, uh, and there's some conjecture about whether it may also improve cartilage and joint fluid and so on. I'm, I remain to be convinced but there's certainly this anti-inflammatory effect. So there's a there's a role for them. I'm not a fan of all the other stuff, but I think the, the green muscle has a role. Yeah, um, you can get it just from health shops, from most pharmacies, um, uh, and, and think of it as working as an anti-inflammatory. However, it is very much an entrance level drug, so it's the lowest uh, uh, potency, if you like, of all the medications. So it's a, maybe a sensible thing to start when your dog's sort of seven or eight, and you're just looking at them, going, mm, are, you, "Are you slowing down? Are you not slowing down?" Um, and, and you can't, and your vet can't really find anything. Then I think perfectly sensible. Try get them going on that. And then, like I say, then start adding more stuff on. Or if you do starting at the 12, 13 year old with whichever, let's say a non steroidal anti inflammatory, then there's absolutely it's sensible, I think, to bring in some green lip muscle with it. But think of it as making sort of the, the, the minor contribution to the problem. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe a five or as much as 10% improvement, but the big improvements are going to be had with the more conventional treatments. So, um, so I hope that makes some sort of sense to everyone. I think it is just, for me, it's a massive thing. I think all, almost all dogs over the age of seven or eight are gonna have some degree of osteoarthritis. Uh, and uh, um, if they need help, we absolutely must help them. Certainly once you crest 10, there's a strong case to really consider everyone. And yes, thankfully not everybody needs help, uh, um, but it's important to find out at, uh, uh, when they need the help uh, and to give it to them. And, and I, say, I say not everybody needs help. I mean, maybe not in the here and now, but we're all gonna to get to a point where we have significant wear and tear on our joints and I would be very disappointed if, if, if um, someone uh, who had con sway over, over my life uh, made the decision to deprive me of medications that would potentially help me. So, so please, 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 please give it some thought, particularly if you have older dogs that you think are slowing up, uh, and very definitely if you have dogs who are clearly lame and limping or difficulty rising from rest, um, please go and speak to your vet. Please try some medication. You will massively improve their quality of life and also your quality of life because they're in, of their interaction with you improving. Uh, and they almost go back to, to, to sort of having quite a, a puppyish uh, outlook on life. So please do it for me. Please investigate the options. It um, doesn't really matter where you get the medications from, uh, but get the advice first from your vet and, um, and let's, get this, let's, get, let's get the help into these guys. So thank you all very much for tuning in. Uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.